Good morning and Happy New Year. Can you believe we're in 2016? Unbelievable. And so someone sent me a little message saying, I hope uh, your 16 is sweet or something. <laughs> it's so bad when you try to say something that somebody else has said and you don't quite get it. But here's what the Word of God says as we're moving a little quickly this morning because I have an appointment at 2 o'clock. So, and let me just say this. Because it's the worst thing, especially when someone's standing in the pulpit and they go, turn to Psalms 1, blah, 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 blah. Unlike any of the other books, the, what are the Psalms? The Psalms are poetic expressions of the depths of our hearts. When you want to express that grief that is just wrenching out at your soul, or you want to express the joy of the ecstasy that God has just taken you through, all of that is found in the book of Psalms. And so... What it is, is it, again, it's these poetic expressions, poetry, uh, songs, and, and it, was, it was a part of the life style. Let me, let me get this piece out of the way first. So you have the book of Psalms, but when you are speaking about a particular psalm, it is psalm singular, okay? It is not psalms one, because it is one poetic expression. Okay, so it's the book of Psalms, but when you turn to an individual chapter, it is Psalm without the S. Mm -hmm. Love to teach. So Psalm 1, which we're all very familiar with, says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. That is so rich when you just be still and just contemplate each little section here. It just, it, it's a guarantee for blessedness. And what is blessedness that we remember from the Beatitudes? What does it mean when it says, blessed is the man who is poor in spirit? It means, oh, how happy is the man. Oh, how happy is the man who walks not in the council. I'm getting ahead of myself. He shall be planted like, he shall be like a tree, like a tree planted by the rivers of the water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also should not wither and whatever he does shall prosper. I just read that. I wanted to read Eugene Peterson's contemporary. I mean, he really brings it home for us. He says, how well God must like you. You don't hang out in sin saloon, in sin saloon. You don't slink along dead end row. You don't go to smart mouth college. Woo! Instead, you thrill to God's word. You chew on scripture day and night you're a tree replanted in Eden bearing fresh fruit every month never dropping a leaf always in blossom these two are just you know I for most of you that know me know that I love to, 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 to preach from the Gospels especially the Gospel of Matthew where we have more of Jesus teachings I don't come from the Psalms that much but Outside of everybody knowing that John 3.16 is probably the most memorized scripture in God's holy word, it is the book of Psalms which are the most popular. You know, 23rd Psalm, 100th Psalm, 39th, I mean, there it goes on and on. I'm sure that you have a favorite. Because when our heart is just, you know, my girlfriend lost her mom yesterday and just, you know, when we're so sad, you know, you go to the book of Psalms. When you're just excited and you want to do your little praise dance for God and you want to put your little video thing together, you probably pull a psalm. Here at the Washington Home, we repeat the 100th Psalm almost every Sunday. That's one of our favorites. No matter what I'm preaching on, we can pull a scripture or two from the 100th Psalm and relate it to what we're going to be talking about. And we just talk about how amazing that psalm is. You have to understand the character of the Psalms in order to understand or bring it all into context. And without going way into that, uh, we did that this morning, but just want to kind of reiterate just one or two things. The fact that 
as we look at our email today or you know we have our iPhones with those things that are so much a part of everyday life so were the Psalms they were for private devotion but more importantly for bringing in public worship but it was a part of the everyday life of the people then to write a psalm, to, 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 to bring it into their private and public worship to God. And they were lyrics to be played out in the synagogue with music and, and worship, that all that stuff that comes together on Sunday morning. You know, first Sunday at, at Mount Jezreel was a great time, you know, with everybody just, you know, full of the praise and worship. And, that's what the Psalms were about. And so anything that you're looking for, you'll find it there. The other thing that Psalms were uh, considered to be um, parallelisms. Uh, in this one, we have two or three, I remember, uh, synonymous parallelism. And that's pretty much from the root word synonym, synonym being a similar element, you know, for those who meditate on the law and delight in the law, those two similar elements. And then you have um, uh, a progressional where you have a figurative thing like he shall be like a tree and then you just kind of expound upon that as you go along. What I want to talk about is as people have walked into 2016, we talked a little about it last week, they've made New Year's resolutions. The gentleman that's doing the video now, his New Year's resolution is to work out more. The gentleman that helped bring the residents down this morning, his New Year's resolution is to work out more. Uh, WGTS did a survey and they were saying that even in spite of everybody that wants to work out more this year, overwhelming, the main thing that people desire to do is to live life to the fullest. And so I thought that whatever your resolution is, for it to materialize, and to come to fruition, you have to have a plan. And so our thing today was a plan to be blessed. And how wonderful is it that even as we try to figure things out, and a lot of times we don't get it right, is that we don't have to figure this out. It says, blessed is a man. So, oh, how happy the man will be. And then it's giving us the plan in order to fulfill that. And anybody that has a New Year's resolution, no matter what it is, at the, at the end of the day, we all want to be happy, filled with happiness. And so to not do this is to be a fool. It's as simple as that. Because not only will you not be happy, you will have a life that leads to death. And that is what this psalm is saying. Just the first three verses. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. So it's saying that we are not to be into all of the stuff that's going on. You know, as, as the new year rolls in, people, what is, Oprah's got the uh, Weight Watchers and Dr. Phil has this going on. And, you know, unless you know people to be godly, and I'm not saying that they're not, but we do know people that are. And we don't seek advice from those people. Most times we go to magazines, when you're at the checkout counter in the, the supermarkets, every magazine has something on the cover that alludes to the best five this or the top ten ways to do this or that. That's a lot of advice from the world. And things that are very popular, the top list, the ends and the out. I don't give the Washington Post anymore, but it used to be in with this and out with that. All of these things are advice as to what you ought to be doing now and what you had to leave in 2015. And the fact of the matter is, is that where are you getting your information from? Where are you getting your advice from? And it says, the man that will be happy will get his advice from the godly. It's as simple as that. In other words, and we love to say this, 1 plus 2 equals 3, therefore 2 plus 1 must equal 3. Therefore, if you get your advice from people that are ungodly, you will not be happy. That simple. Then it says, and it's a progressional thing here, it says, walk not, now stand not. When you start getting advice from the ungodly, you start walking in the path of the sinners. What's the path of the sinners? Eugene Peterson says that you don't slink along dead in row. The path of sinners leads to destruction. The path of sinners leads to a dead end. There's nothing down there. And he says he uses, I love the way he uses the word slink, because slink is something that you're kind of winding and winding. It's, it's, a, it's a time thing. You're wasting your time and you're going nowhere. Eventually you get to the 
dead end, you're going to have to make a U-turn. You're going to have to go back to God if you want to get somewhere. If you want to go nowhere, then go ahead and go that way because that's where you're going to end up. Nowhere, a dead end. Amen? And as you slink, you're wasting time. We're only here for a season that we call life. And so it says that if you start taking advice from these people, the advice that the ungodly gives you is simply going to put you on a path to nowhere. Then it goes on to say, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. What's that ended up, Eugene? I already understand that. Do not go to smart mouth college. When you start getting to the dead end, what comes to the dead end? Frustration. What comes at frustration? You start snapping at people. You wonder why people are so mean all the time. It has nothing to do, and they'll try and make it seem like it has something to do with you. It's something on the inside. It's the frustration that we have with life. Why are people unable to forgive? Because they're not happy with their life. People can do whatever they want to do with you. If you're filled with love and filled with joy and just high off of life itself, it doesn't matter. It's easy to forgive those people. A lot of that has less to do with what the person did to you and more to do with what's happening between your two ears, what's in your heart. And so this is saying, as you take advice from those people, this is where it's going to lead. And then all these other characteristic things are going to happen that are not characteristic of the man or woman that is going to be happy because he is obedient to God's word. And what does God's word tell us to do? And his delight, but his delight is in the law. So here's that similar element. But his delight is in the law and his law he meditates in day and night. There's another passage where uh, Moses is, uh, God is telling jo Joshua that if you chew basically the same thing, meditate on my word day and light, you will have control of everything that happens in your life. That's why I said earlier, this is a rich passage because it's, it's, it's simple. Life is simple when we just follow God's instruction. So it says meditating day and night on the word. And then it says in the law of God. The law meaning what? The law meaning the first five books. That's where you have the laws, where it teaches how we came to be, who we are, what we ought to be doing. Yes, but we also know from 2 Timothy 3.16 that all scripture is God inspired. So everything in here is what we're meditating on. And what does the word meditate in Greek? The meditation word means to mumble something, to recite, to repeatedly say something. And so as I'm talking to them today about the 100th Psalm, these things that they've learned over the last few months, is this is what God wants us to do. As we're meditating on his word, when people come against us, we have that sword because we know what the word of God is. So I saying meditate on his word day and night. Day and night means not just on Sunday morning, not just when we get up and do our morning devotion, but all throughout the day, all throughout the night, constantly allowing God's word to be on your heart. And then if we do these things, we shall be not like a seed planted to be a tree or a tree seed, but we shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that insinuates a trans plant. And Eugene Peterson says as much, not transplant, but he says, you're a tree replanted in Eden. And so that's beautiful because it speaks to everything that Paul tells us about the old man is left over here. The new man, you're still you, the physical form of you, but there's something on the inside. So we're going to take this thing here. We're going to uproot it. We're going to take you out of this area of friends that you have, out of this environment of these things that you've thought, and put you in a new place. And that new place is going to connect you with the living water. Jesus told the woman at the well, if you knew of me, then you would never be thirsty again. And so this is what it's saying. It's saying the date palm actually is a tree that they're talking about. The date palm grows in the desert and it grows up way beyond 30 feet and its leaves stretch out to be like a foot long. It bears as much as 300 pounds of dates in its season. The revised English translation says that you shall bear fruit in every season. You know, I was talking to the residents today and I said some of us could have been great ushers during our time, may have been soloists in the choir, whatever the case may have been, for that season when they had independent life 
But now they're here at the Washington home. They're still the children of God. God still expects us to bear fruit. The Bible says what? That not only do we bear fruit, but we bear much fruit. Not only do we bear much fruit, but we bear much good fruit. Do you know it's not something people are always talking about taking a break in the church and, you know, get some rest, which is all good. God will give it to you when he wants to give it to you. In the meantime, as long as we're willing to be used, as long as we are seeking to be obedient, then we will be bearing much good fruit in every season. And when you go back and look at the date palm tree, they used it for everything. As you know, even in this century, some 2,000 years later, we use the leaves for worship on Palm Sunday. The dates in and of themselves, I use them in my practice when I'm trying to get people's health restored. They have uh, uh, copper, magnesium, manganese, almost every element is in the date. And it's so sweet, so it helps us to suppress the, the appetite. So not only are you getting this sweet fruit that comes from the tree, the leaves are used for worship today, was used for worship then. We know when he entered into Jerusalem, they waved the palms and they sang Hosanna. But more importantly, even the seed, the seed can be grounded down to a powder and it's been very, very beneficial for feeding the cattle back in that day. And so, and then the wine that comes, you know, a lot of people, you know, whether you drink wine or not, the fact of the matter is, go to the date palm tree and that can be done. Charcoal, a lot of things can come from the different elements, either the date itself, the seed of the date, the leaf, and then the wood, the wood of the tree in and of itself can be grinded down and lots of things are made and utilized from that. And so we say this to say that that's the tree that was in the mind of the psalmist when this was written for the significance for you and I to understand that God can use us in a multiplicity of ways. A lot of times there are even classes today on finding your gift. We're gift. We can do anything. We're all equipped with the same gift and that's the Holy Spirit. And when you're willing to be used, God will use you for whatever he needs you to be used for in a particular situation. And so this planting of the tree near the rivers of the water, when we're always connected to the living water, which is God, we will be bearing fruit and much good fruit in every season and we will be constantly used over and over and over again. And it says that our leaf will never wither and everything that we do shall prosper. When we are seeking the counsel of God, when we are walking in the ways of God, when we're sitting and not mocking God but being amongst the other saints, then everything we do shall prosper. What else could we look for in 2016? What else could we need? We want to be happy, but we want to be used mightily by God. And when we are allowing God to use us, we will be everything. Everything. I mean, I just, I, I've always loved this scripture, but it's amazing that every time you come back to God's where I think I've even preached about it, maybe once over the last 10 years or so, but the new revelation with everything else that's going on in my life, what happened in 2015, what I'm looking for, uh, forward to in 2016. It just says, here it is. Keep doing what you've been doing. It says in one of these scriptures or one of the translations, and Eugene Peterson, it says, instead, thrill to God's word. You know, people are excited about the Redskins playing Dallas today. And people are excited about, you know, the new year and what it's bringing, the weather, all this kind of stuff. Whatever. Some people are excited about eating. We love to eat. You know, when, when there's a game, there's, you know, buffalo wings going on. And so it's saying that when you thrill the word of God, when you look forward to reading God's word, when you're excited about it, when it becomes a part of you, then you, you just, you hold on to it. And when you're holding on to that, everything will be well. And there you will have your happiness. And that's a word for 2016.